from your local election headquarters. The race for Caddo Sheriff, Louisiana Governor, House, and Senate. This is Campaign 2023, the Louisiana Vote. Good evening and welcome to our election special. I'm Dan Jovic. And I'm Jackie Jovic. If you're watching us on KTALnews.com, you can scroll down to see election results. We're following 85 races in Northwest Louisiana, so if you miss the results you want to see, you can find them all on our website, your local election headquarters. And tonight we're bringing you live team coverage with our crews at watch parties for the biggest races in our area, including the race for Cano Parish Sheriff, State Senate District 39, and of course, the number one item on everyone's ballot tonight, that being Louisiana Governor. All right, let's get it right to it. Let's take a look at the results for Louisiana governor. No surprise, Jeff Landry, the clear front runner. That's what we expected. He has 49% of the vote right now. Sean Wilson is the closest thing. Uh, second place, 27%. So the interesting thing is that Republicans, the other Republicans really didn't make a dent in this. No, that's very surprising. You would have thought that someone would at least get closer to 10% of the vote tonight. That's not even happening. Yeah. So there's really only one thing we're watching tonight, and that's to see if Jeff Landry will get that additional one percentage point to ultimately become Louisiana's governor tonight and avoid a runoff election. Let's bring in our uh, political analysts this evening. We have Stephen Parr and Theron Jackson. Thank you for always being here with us. Thank you. Is this surprising that the other Republican candidates didn't make a bigger dent? What surprises me is that they didn't drop out earlier. Th these numbers, the exact same they've been since May. Uh, we talked about this on uh, our radio show back earlier this year on, on American Ground Radio. We, we said, look, if, if you get to the summer and you don't have money and your poll hasn't gotten into double digits, you need to ask yourself why you're still in the race. Because as we said on the show at the end, these candidates at this point are looking at the biggest loss of their political life tonight. And that's exactly the way it's playing out. The polls in this race have been remarkably consistent. No Republican candidate other than Jeff Landry since the summer or since the beginning of the summer has had double digit numbers. If you don't get to double digits, how are you going to get into the runoff when the Democrat candidate has been polling consistently between 25 and 30 percent of the vote? So that's this is unchanged from where it's been for months. I, again, I think the biggest question is why why didn't they drop out earlier like Richard Nelson did? So Theron, tonight, um, are, are, is that where we're at with this this uh, election? Uh, we're just watching to see if one percentage point comes in because it's pretty clear. Jeff Landry is going to be the governor of Louisiana with the Republicans polling in the percentages they have. If those votes go his way, it's going to be a landslide victory in a runoff. I think the, the victory at this point uh, for at least the Democrat, in this case, Sean Wilson, would be to make a runoff. Mm -hmm. um, There's no guarantee there. But I think uh, I was telling Stephen that I think seeing the GOP, the actual party itself, coalesce so soon behind one candidate mm -hmm. and watching the U.S. senators and other uh, Republican who's who line up behind um, the Jeff Landry, that was a sign that this night would, would be, if not this, certainly similar to this. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of support coming out early in the early voting for Sean Wilson. Democrats didn't come out as strongly as you would have expected. What was the issue there? Well, typically, um, we were talking earlier that the Democrats vote um, outvote Republicans in early voting. It didn't happen this time. Um, take um, the a large block of the Democratic Party, which is African American voters, down eight percent this year as compared to 2019 um, in the last gubernatorial uh, election. And so a lot of it, I think, had to do with organization and motivation. And I think um, the, now Republican turnout was about 12 percent, right? I mean, excuse me, down. Uh, if you take uh, Republicans, they were down 12 percent, I think. But the aggregate number was greater and Republicans turned out greater in the early voting than, and I think it's the first time that's happened in, I don't know, in recent history, certainly. Yeah. And as you're talking about with, with Jeff Landry being united by a lot of the Republican voters and a lot of the Republican policy makers, Sean Wilson did have the endorsement of the governor and that was powerful for him, but he did not seem to gain uh, an excitement. He did not seem to enthuse the voting block within the Democrat party. In Louisiana, somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of voters are Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yet for the entire of this campaign, he's been polling again between 25 and 30 percent. He's only been polling about, about two thirds of the Democrat voters in the state. 
if he was really exciting the Democrat base, you would expect that number to be closer to 35 percent rather than 25. Yeah, I would agree that enthusiasm has not been there. Gentlemen, right. thank you so much. We're going to check in with you throughout the course of our evening tonight here. Let's turn our attention now to the race for Louisiana State Senate District 39. Brought out some heavy political hitters on the Shreveport side. Let's take a look at the results thus far. We're seeing that Sam Jenkins is in the lead with 40% of the vote. Cedric Glover has 28%. Uh, James Slagle, 17%. Barbara Norton polling at 15%. So we're probably not going to have a winner here tonight, Janky. But it looks as if those two gentlemen, Jenkins and Glover, are going to run off. That's right. And NBC 6's Julisha Gatewood is standing by live with Sam Jenkins to tell us more about what's going on at his watch party. Julisha? Yeah, Dan and Jackie, good evening to you. I'm here at the Hilton downtown with the man of the hour, as well as his friends, families, and supporters, Mr. Sam Jenkins. How are you feeling so far? Uh, we, we feel very good. We feel very good about where we are right now. You know, it's been a very long election day, but it's been very meaningful. We uh, worked very hard to get to where we are right now, so we're just waiting to see how the returns come in. Okay, right now you're leading the election with 40% of the vote. Speak to that. How do you feel about that so far? I am humbled. I'm very humbled. You know, I know those numbers are early, but I'm very humbled. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, have done everything we can to let the people know we want to serve, we want to lead, we want to try to make sure that we're doing some good things here in this area. We've heard from them and what they'd like to see down here in Northwest Louisiana, and we're hoping that we will be in a position to carry out that message. As a, as a former city councilman and cattle parish commissioner, what are you looking to finish um, if you're elected to fill the seat? Look, we, we really got to restore leadership here in Northwest Louisiana first and foremost. We need to learn how to work together as leaders because when we're not working together, uh, the people suffer. Secondly, we got to bring some good paying jobs back to this area. We've had too many of our industrial plants to close. A lot of good people out of work. We need to try to make sure that we can put every man, every woman that wants a job back to work. And then certainly we want to do some things to keep our millennials, our young people in this area. We've lost over 17,000 people from this area. I'm very, very disturbed by that. And we need to make certain that we are doing some things to attract uh, young people and to keep young people in this area. All righty, sir. Well, thank you so much for having us. Also, you guys, um, if, you, uh, uh, if you get some of the vote, for the runoff, how are you going to feel about the runoff once you get, if you're able to get the runoff? 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 <laughs> well, you guys, you, you heard it here at the watch party for Sam Jenkins. We're going to send it back to you guys in the studio. Uh, yeah, that's great confidence. Yeah, I like it. that's it. He's <laughs> thinking there's not going to be a runoff tonight. <laughs> yeah, we're rejoined by our political analyst, Theron Jackson, and Stephen Parr. Gentlemen, uh, the endorsement of outgoing state Senator Greg Tarver proved to be huge in Sam Jenkins' campaign. Let's start with you, Theron. Yeah, I think um, that was helpful in certain areas of the district that Sam may have been unfamiliar mm -hmm. with. Sure. But I think having been a state representative in all of his uh, state rep district being in the, the district he's been a city councilman and a commissioner that the state senator's endorsement may have been a boost mm -hmm. but I think uh, largely it was Sam's representation uh, in that district for all of this time he's been again commissioner councilman state representative and so it didn't hurt to have it it was one of those things that it was better to have it in not needed, then needed and not have it. So. <laughs> of course, of yeah. course. Now, uh, he's very confident and thinking there won't be a runoff. Uh, we still have a lot of precincts left to report, but it is highly likely that it's going to be a runoff between him and Cedric Glover. What yeah. will <laughs> Cedric Glover need to do uh, to win over the other voters? The uh, first thing, Cedric Glover would have to, one, win over all the Republican voters in that district and to convince them to come out to vote for him. So turnout in a, in a runoff election would be very, very important. So he's gonna have to do that. He's also gonna have to convince Barbara Norton's voters to come over to his side. The lead that Sam Jenkins has right now sitting at about 40%, if that goes up any, then he's very, very close to a complete victory, especially when you start to figure out that, that people who vote for other candidates are less likely to show up in a runoff election. If you're, if you're behind going into the runoff election, you've got a big sales job to do to get those other people to decide they wanna come out, not just to, to vote, but to vote for you. That's a, that's a tough road to, to well, pull. The, the, Stephen, you speak to it, too, about uh, attracting the Republican voter. Theron, this is something that uh, Cedric's done before. It is not something that is unfamiliar to him. And in the last mayoral election, he threw his weight ultimately in the end behind a Republican candidate. Right. Well, I'll tell you, um, most of 
the Republican candidates, excuse me, Republican support that Cedric's had in the past has all been uh, Republican support in the city of Shreveport. Mm -hmm. In this district, that Republican report, I mean, support largely will come from rural areas. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the aid of the outgoing senator would be a help to um, to Sam mm -hmm. and uh, whatever Mr. Slagle decides to do, mm -hmm. I think will be helpful as well. So I think whoever is able to um, secure his endorsement, and I think that's where Senator Tarver's endorsement will help in those areas that he's represented for 30 years, mm -hmm. um, Republicans and Democrats. So I think that's what we'll see when it comes down to that. Cedric's battle will be how do I get to the rural mm -hmm. um, Republican voters. All right, thank you very, very much. All right, we're gonna take a look at the results for Caddo Parish Sheriff now. Let's see here, we have John Nicholson in the lead. He got the endorsement of uh, outgoing Sheriff Steve Prater. Henry Whitehorn, 37% of the vote. And of course, that's what we've been expecting for um, this race too. Those two would be the, the front runners tonight. Yeah, that's what we thought. We thought it was really going to be a two horse race in this one. And Jackie, you talk about the all important uh, endorsement that Nicholson received from outgoing uh, Sheriff Steve Prater. Prater served this community for so long and had the Republican Party vote on lock. It looks as if him saying, please turn out for Nicholson work tonight. Yes, yeah, certainly. And he's been well respected for so many years. And, and that is working in John Nicholson's favor. Right. Well, we're going to check in with NBC Six's Brittany DeFran. She is over at Henry Whitehorn's watch party. Brittany, set the scene for us. Hey Dan Jackie, that is right. We're here as friends and family are gathering for the watch party for Henry Whitehorn. And now he's not down here mingling, but he is in the building. Now Whitehorn says that he is the only candidate with local, state, and federal law enforcement experience. And he says he has what it takes uh, to run that sheriff's office seat. Now Whitehorn has served as state police superintendent, Shreveport chief of police, and United States Marshal. After serving a decade as a United States Marshal for the Western District of Louisiana. Whitehorn retired, but now he's hoping to get back in action and reduce crime in Caddo Parish. Now, if elected, Whitehorn plans to focus on partnerships and youth programs as critical tools to prevent crime. We'll be here all night watching live reaction from Whitehorn's campaign watch party for your local election headquarters. I'm Brittany DeFran. Dan Jackie. Uh, Brittany, thanks so much. Here's another look at those results as they stand right now for Caddo Parish Sheriff. You're seeing that uh, John Nicholson currently has 44% of the vote to Henry Whitehorn's 37% of the vote. Jackie, at that pace, I don't think John Nicholson uh, could possibly win this thing outright. It seems as if there will be going to a, a runoff election for that post. Certainly, because there's 30% of the vote and uh, they're just separated by seven percentage points. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's going to I think it's going to go to a runoff also. We're going to check in with Miriam Samake. She is at John Nicholson's watch party. Miriam, what's going on there? Hi, Dan and Jackie. Yes, I am here at John Nicholson's watch party. We're here at Frank's Pizza amongst his friends and families. The energy here is full of uh, excitement a little bit. We saw some early results showing Nicholson is actually in the lead. And uh, Dan and Jackie, as you mentioned, Nicholson is the only candidate to have the current sheriff's um, endorsement, Steve Prater. Steve Prater actually was the one who told John Nicholson to actually run. And uh, Dan and Jackie, uh, Nicholson served on Shreveport City Council for District C, and he said crime was his top priority. He's also been a lawyer for 20 years, so Nicholson said those qualities and having been an elected official make him the best candidate. He says public safety is vital for a community to thrive. And Nicholson, a big thing that he is campaigning on is making Caddo Parish safe by uh, consistently arresting and incarcerating those violent criminals um, with appropriate punishment and keeping them off of the street. So I'm going to be here continuing to bring you those live reactions from John Nicholson's watch party for now, for reporting live uh, for your local election headquarters. I'm Miriam Samake, Dan and Jackie. Miriam, thanks so much for that. Our analysts return now. And Stephen, I'd like to start with you because John Nicholson's lack of law enforcement background is not appearing to matter with voters this evening. It, so far, it's early. We, mm -hmm. we only have 17 out of 157 precincts in Cattle Parish that have reported on this. So there's still a lot of race to go here. And it really will really depend upon which areas are reporting, which ones are still out. But I think the polling showed early that the number one 
The number one issue in this race would have been who Sheriff Steve Prater endorsed. A lot of folks said that I trust Sheriff Prater. He's been a good sheriff for us for a long time. Whoever he says should be sheriff, well, that's who we're going to vote for. Well, Sheriff Prater called John Nicholson at home and said, John, I want you to run. He was his hand-picked successor, and I think that is playing a lot. I am surprised that, that Chief Whitehorn actually isn't higher in the polls right now because all of the absentee votes are in, and in Caddo Parish, the Democrat Party had a much higher absentee vote, especially compared to even four years ago, mm -hmm. and so I expected that to have translated into votes for, for Chief Whitehorn. For this to be still this close with all those absentee votes in, uh, I do find interesting. And Mr. Whitehorn's experience, I mean, is unmatched. Is it law enforcement experience. This is going to go to a runoff likely. What does he need to do to communicate how important that is in this race? I have no idea. This is a conundrum to me <laughs> because people seem to be concerned about crime and their law and order, you know, folks who support and yet there is a person who is more qualified than the, ex than the sitting sheriff, quite frankly, in law enforcement and the sheriff, uh, I didn't know, Stephen said, called John and I'm thinking there are men and women who served with him over the 24 years he's been sheriff who work in his office who have to be qualified, uh, more qualified than a one-term city councilman. I mean, I guess I kind of could have been sheriff myself, <laughs> you know, with those kind of credentials. But it was just, I was surprised at, at Sheriff Prater, quite frankly. And, and I think what happens is moving forward, people will, there'll be a question of whether or not serious people take the sheriff's office as a political place or a place where it should be law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the real serious question for people who see this beyond Republicans and Democrats, blacks and whites, and think about what's best for this community. And that scared me, to be honest with you, when I saw this race shaping the way it did. It says that we're reducing the chief law enforcement officer in Cattle Parish to just somebody who I prefer rather than somebody who may be the most qualified. So Stephen, is it that? Is it now an administrative position? Uh, at least uh, it, or, it would, if uh, Nicholson were to get elected, is, is it going to be that, an administrator more so than uh, a law enforcer? That, that was one of the things that John Nicholson did talk about. Now he did talk about his legal background and that he is an attorney. He is familiar with Louisiana law. But what he touted was his ability to manage a budget. The sheriff office has the largest budget that is controlled by a single person in the entire parish. And so the argument that John Nicholson was making was that it's, this is an administrative role. I'm good at administration and I have the legal background to understand some things about the law and I will defer some of the local the, the decision making on law enforcement to some of the people that have been trained up under Sheriff uh, Steve Prater. Uh, I, I do think that's part of what he, he's talking about and that's that's the message he's been selling. I, I it's think interesting because Whitehorn is the CAO. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, it had to. His qualifications are yeah, you know, nobody, nobody can question. Right. The Absolutely. council votes on the budget, but it's the job of the CAO to manage the budget. Correct. Right. Uh, but but I think what the real the reason I use the term conundrum is because those who have been around Shreveport, Cattle Parish for a long time know. Twenty four years ago, we had a sheriff who was Don Hathaway. Don Hathaway had no law enforcement experience. And so when Steve Prater ran as the chief of police, he said, this is a law enforcement job. And this guy, he's been there a long time. Um, he wasn't a cop before, right? And I've been the chief of police. And it's amazing what 24 years has done to change that sentiment, perhaps. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, and of course, we'll keep checking in with you during the night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, gentlemen. Let's turn our attention now to the uh, sheriff's race on the other side of the River Bossier Sheriff Julian Whittington. He's been in office uh, for quite a long time and um, he and served for 35 years in the department and more than a dozen uh, as chief. That's right. Yeah. And Chris Green was uh, vying to uh, see if he could unseat him. You see, that's not happening this <laughs> evening. Uh, we kind of anticipated this was going to be a blowout win for uh, Julian Whittington, and it's proven to be exactly that tonight. All right. Well, we are having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Let's talk a little bit more about this race here. Uh, we didn't send our reporter to it because we had a, a very good understanding that Julian Whittington was going to win this race. Tonight. To be honest, I'm surprised that he was even challenged in that seat. Usually with races like this, Jackie, the person who uh, is running against or even has an inkling to run against a sheriff like this says, I'm going to bow, bow out. And uh, you know, Stephen spoke to the point earlier as to why the Republicans do, didn't do that on the gu gubernatorial side. You would have thought something like that would have happened. Here. Well, it was very interesting with Chris Green when he was talking about this. He was um, 
a deputy for 14 and a half years. He retired about five years ago, opened a business and thought, you know, I like Bozier. I want to run for sheriff um, and get some things done that he had suggested while he worked for the office. But I mean, it's, you can't really beat Julian Whittington. No, <laughs> he's been it's an not happen, and, no. Yeah, and he's, he's beloved in, in Bozier Parish, so. All right, let's turn our attention now to the Louisiana Lieutenant Governor's race, and uh, we're seeing where that currently stands. Billy Nungesser has 66% of the vote, with 62% of the precincts reporting. It appears Billy Nungesser is going to win this uh, Lieutenant Governor's race outright tonight. There will be uh, no runoff, which is not surprising. Nungesser, extremely popular within the state of Louisiana. In fact, had he ran for governor, who knows where the race would be tonight? Yeah, he is extremely popular and he covers every part of the state, touting tourism and, and boosting um, support for all of the wonderful things that we have here in the state for visitors to come and see. So yeah, he's, and he's just a lot of fun. So he's very likable. <laughs> he's a likable man, <laughs> yes. no question about it. Let's take a look at our next, uh, oh, we're gonna bring in our analysts uh, now uh, with that. Guys, let's uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Lieutenant Governor's race. We knew that Nungesser was gonna win tonight, right? Yeah. Why didn't he throw his hat in the ring and run for governor? People had talked about it. He's so likable. I mean, he just, he's a gregarious man. It seems as if he has support from both sides too, at least some support. Why didn't he get in the race? If, if he had, he'd be at the 6% that Steve Waggis packed and think John so? Schroeder's at. Really? Uh, what happened last year was about this time last year, Jeff Landry said, I'm running for governor. And then Jeff Landry began running for governor. And he got the endorsements of most of the members of the Republican Executive Co uh, Committee in the state. He got endorsements from Donald Trump Jr. He got endorsements from senators. He got endorsements from basically anybody who was handing out an endorsement. And by the time that Billy Nungesser decided whether he was going to run for governor or not, Jeff Landry was way out ahead in both support and in money. I, I think Billy Nungesser looked at it and went, that's probably a losing campaign for sure. me. Whereas if he ran again, for lieutenant governor, he could win on the first ballot just like he's, he's showing up tonight. So I think Billy Nungesser did the math and that's why he ended up in the race he ended up in. Right. Well, I, I, think it, I, I think it's two things. One, as Stephen said, maybe in October, Jeff Landry officially said, Jeff Landry's been running for governor since he became the attorney general. That's and, um, yes, exactly. yeah. and every time he took a strike at the governor, it was to, to double down on the fact that he's running for governor. And he um, coddled himself uh, with uh, Donald Trump. And the real issue for, I think, Louisiana, is I think you're right about Billy, uh, Lieutenant Governor Nungesser, he is a, a, a likable guy who seems kind of centrist to some extent. I don't know if there's any place for those kind of people in Louisiana in Republican politics anymore. Stephen made no difference, but it appears to me that everybody's running to the Trump end of the party to say that's who I am and Jeff Landry's outdone everybody of that this time around. He certainly has. All right, thank you so much. We're gonna take a look at the Louisiana State Senate District races in District 31. Alan Seaball is the clear winner with 53% of the votes, 69% well, of precincts reporting right yeah, now. It's so. a close race there. Yeah. It's an interesting one too because uh, to speak to Theron's point there, Mike McConathy tried to establish himself as the most pro-Trump candidate in that race. It's not working this evening thus far. Turning our attention to Louisiana State Senate District 33, uh, that race uh, between Stuart Cathy and Harvey White, it looks as if Cathy has got 53 percent of the vote. The polls are getting closer to closing there. 83 percent uh, have voted in that race. All right, we're going to take a look at the results in Louisiana State Senate District 36. Adam Bass with 61% of the vote there, 72% of the precincts reporting, so he is a clear winner there. Turning our attention now to the results for Louisiana State Senate District 38. Hotly contested race right here. Thomas Presley currently has 58% of the vote. Longtime Republican lawmaker John Milkovich coming in at only 25% of the vote. A lot of money fl uh, flowed into that race. A surprising amount uh, for a state Senate race. Thomas Presley looking as if he's going to take that outright potentially not even needing to get to a runoff in that race. All right, another time to talk to our analysts. Any surprises here in any of these uh, Senate races? 
Um, uh, actually, no, <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. Uh, the, the Mike McConaughey did try and say he was the more Trump candidate, it's but if you look at how Alan Seaball's voted yeah. ever since he's been in the House, it's hard to say that there's been anybody in the right. House who's been more conservative than Alan Seaball right. over the last 12 years. So for for you to try to run to the right of Alan Seaball, that's that's going to be a pretty difficult haul. Uh, one of the things that, w with the, the Thomas Presley campaign and the Alan Seabaugh campaign, those turned nasty. Yes, they did. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, mailers going out. People's mailboxes have gotten very full. There's been a lot of online and uh, on-air uh, ads, and people are calling people liars right and left. Those races got absolutely nasty, and uh, in, in part, people will turn negative in advertising, frankly, because it works. Right. I'll tell you, the evolution of politics unfortunately there's a, this national feel and where everything used to be local and it was about the geography of the state of louisiana it was about the things that mattered in the state so much so that i i challenge you to find ads that talked about issues and not about people mm -hmm. most ads talked about the opponents um, none talked about economic development education better school systems, you know, um, better uh, preparation for hurricanes. We, we didn't talk about any of the things that really plague Louisiana because now you don't have to talk about issues to get elected. Yeah, it is a very, very interesting time um, locally and in a, across the country. And it's a little exhausting, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you exhausting. think about the fact you have a person who may be the governor in one ballot mm -hmm. who never did a debate. It's all about e echo chambers all about singular messaging and if you don't show up for debate that's a, a civics you would think and it's a civil thing to do in the state and the leading candidate never did that and it's like Talk we don't Jeff demand Landry. it. Yeah. Yes. He did show up for, for the next star debate yes. yes. I was happy to be a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm so we sorry. Were, we were able to yeah. do that one. It leads me to one point. He came to one, right? He came to one. Steve, I have a point, I have a question to ask of you. Is it now simply about the person who's willing to fight? as opposed to the person who has a record. They're, they're just showing up and saying, I'm willing to take on the battle and I'm willing to be um, viewed as the bad guy by the other side. Is that the leader in the clubhouse now, simply the guy who wants to fight more than the other? Uh, that is certainly par part of it. Uh, and, and again, that somewhat comes from Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the way Donald Trump has approached politics, it's been about I'm willing to fight. I'm the only guy who's willing to stand up for fight for you. And, and that's, that's what he's uh, done on that. If you look at um, the, maybe the second biggest name in the uh, Republican Party uh, over in Florida, the governor in Florida has also been someone willing to fight. And there have been a lot of people saying Louisiana needs a governor like Florida had a governor. If you look at what Florida has accomplished with their economic development, with their population, I mean, back in the 1960s, we had the exact same number of representatives in the House of Representatives and Florida has passed us up. Why is that? And so I, I think people are saying, you know what, we've, we've tried some of these other things, it's not working. So yes, they are asking for a more combative person. Now, there's a very big question as to whether that will actually be effective or not, but it is what people are in, in many, not all people, but it is what I think many people are looking for. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna look at some more results now. We're gonna take a look at the Louisiana Secretary of State's race. Uh, it's a close one across the board. Nancy Landry uh, ahead with 20% of the vote. Gwen Collins Greenup, 19%. Mike Francis, 18 And Clay Schecksneider, 15 percent. Yeah, so. Stephen was saying that race could go anywhere tonight yes. and and that's proven to be the case. Turning our attention now to Louisiana Attorney General, 73 percent of the polling is in there. Liz Morrell is the leading candidate. Don't know if she's going to get to that magic number of 50 percent, but Morrell had the endorsement of Senator John Kennedy in her ads. And so no surprise there that she's uh, got a substantial lead in the race for Louisiana Attorney General. Now let's look at state treasurer. John Fleming, 45% of the vote, followed by Dustin Granger at, with 31%. Not really a surprise, uh, John Fleming is well known here in the state. Absolutely, a household name with the uh, time that he served in the United States Congress. Let's take another look now at the results for a Louisiana governor. Let's give you an update as to where those stand right now. Louisiana Governor Jeff, uh, in the race, excuse me, Jeff Landry was leading before by a slightly larger percentage. 52% uh, is where he currently stands now. Sean Wilson at 25%. Jackie. 75 percent of the votes are in so uh, we're getting closer to the polls ultimately closing and then uh, we'll see where Landry ends up he's got to get to that uh, you know that magic number and he's there he's now there right he's now, there so now 
We'll see what happens with the last 25% of the vote as it comes in tonight. All right. Uh, are you guys, what are you thinking about our analysts? We're going to bring you guys back in. <laughs> it, what it, are you thinking about the fact that he is pulling ahead now? It depends upon what precincts are still out. If the precincts that are still out are New Orleans precincts, he doesn't make it to 50% tonight. Mm -hmm. If the precincts that are still out are mostly rural precincts, yeah, he's going to make it to 50% and he's going to stay there. Uh, either way, it really does come out that the main role that John Schroeder and Steve Wagaspak have played in this is if, if Jeff Landry doesn't get over the 50% mark, what they really will have accomplished with their race is to force it into a runoff. That's right. all they will have accomplished with this race mm -hmm. is to prevent Jeff Landry from winning outright tonight. Uh, he will then have to make sure he gets people back out to vote. But unless Sean Wilson's able to really energize folks in a way that he has not yet been able to since March, uh, this is going to be Jeff Landry's race even in the runoff. How does Wilson do that? How does he energize the base? I think the key <laughs> is, is not what he does, it's what Jeff Landry does. Mm -hmm. So if Jeff Landry, and, and if we would have had a Governor Responi perhaps, or a Governor Vitter perhaps, but uh, President Trump and some other folks got involved and that buoyed vote on the other side. Without that, it's just a matter of who's left to motivate. And I think if you haven't had a lot of success in the primary motivating it's more difficult to motivate folks in this and so i think the reason john bell edwards particularly in 2019 was re-elected is because of the motivation that donald trump gave the way it worked for democrats sure. and so there's not that the, the boogeyman unless people are able to really uh ferret out the fact that maybe jeff landry's a boogeyman but i've got to tell that message it takes a lot of money and time you haven't done it yet i don't know how it'll get done and there's well, not a lot of time. Yeah, and right. he doesn't have a lot of money in his bank account. Jeff yeah. Landry's got, what, $7 million still in his bank account, and Sean Wilson's at a half a million dollars in his and bank account. And trust is huge, no yeah. question about yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Well, the race for Louisiana State Senate District 39 brought out some heavy hitters in Shreveport politics. We're going to take another look at those results. Currently stands with Sam Jenkins getting 37% of the vote, Cedric Lover 28%, James Slegel the only Republican in that race polling at 19%, Robert Norton bringing up the rear at 16% there. Sam Jenkins got that all important endorsement from a state senator, Greg Tarver, who is term limited at this point. And to be honest, uh, his political career might be over because of his age. I don't think he wants to tackle these issues uh, any further at this point. NBC 6's Julissa Gatewood talked with Sam Jenkins earlier, and he was very confident and very excited. We're going to check in with her again to see if the mood is still the same. Julissa? Yeah, Jackie, I'm here in, at the Hilton downtown, and the mood is still very much the same. He's pretty confident about not going to the runoff. The atmosphere at the watch party is still pretty vibey. We still got food going on, music is going, people are happy, people are enjoying the atmosphere. And when I spoke to Mr. Sam Jenkins, he said that he believes that he's the best fit for the job. And you know, as a former Shreveport City Councilman, Cattle Commissioner, and second term state representative, he says he wants to finish what he started. Now, some of those things that he's focused on are is creating job opportunities like he mentioned before, and health care to help increase Shreveport's declining population, which is also some of the things that he mentioned before. Now we're just waiting for just more of those votes to come in tonight in favor for Sam Jenkins. But for now, we're going to send it back to you guys in the studio for your local election headquarters. I'm Alicia Gatewood. All right. Thank you very much, Alicia. All right, analysts, we're going to wear you out tonight, aren't we? <laughs> 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 Let's talk about this race and how Sam has been able to pull ahead. Well, I think, you know, Cedric had what one would argue is the name recognition, mm -hmm. which means Sam had the most uphill battle. It appears that Sam's done the work uh, in this uphill battle to do that. I think um, with the kind of name recognition that uh, Cedric has, um, you'd, you'd expect to be in first. Um, and that second place is not a good place uh, for this. And so I think uh, Sam's want run a formidable campaign, obviously, and I think that's just, uh, again, uh, having the senator's endorsement helps him in spaces where he may not have had to go, mm -hmm. and, but also having represented that district on three levels uh, matters, I think, as well. Stephen, uh, it's no, no secret locally that State Senator Greg Tarver and Cedric Lover do not get along. Those two are uh, adversaries, uh, and so State Senator Tarver throwing his weight behind Jenkins' endorsement. Is it really Tarver saying, you know, I'm not going to let you get in there? 
He, he may be trying to do that. That may, <laughs> that may be part of what it is. Uh, but with the numbers right now, when we were looking at this race earlier, Sam Jenkins was over 40%, close to 45%. That was going to make it almost impossible for Cedric Glover to be able to gain the, enough support to come back in a, in a runoff. Where the numbers are right now, it looks like it's actually much more possible. If you're looking at a 38 to a 28 vote, 37 to 28 vote, that's the, those are some numbers that Cedric Glover could be able to bring some people over. But four, four years ago in the the governor's race. The Republican ended up, Eddie Rispone ended up losing that race because he made Ralph Abraham's supporters so angry with his negative advertising that they simply didn't show up on election day. He was, he, he was done at that point. Mm -hmm. The question is, can Cedric Glover win over Barbara Norton's voters? Can Cedric Glover win over uh, Jim Slagle's voters? If he can, then he has a decent shot in a runoff, and this will be a very interesting race once again coming up in November. I do think you got it. This is a unique race in that it it won't be the same. It it will literally be a different race with two people versus I four. I think so. I yeah. think so as well. I think it's going to be a completely different race Absolutely. if there's two candidates. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Thank you. We're going to take another look at the results for Caddo Parish Sheriff right now. 51% of the votes then, 42% goes to John Nicholson, 38% to Henry Whitehorn. And we've been saying it's very interesting because Henry Whitehorn certainly has the law enforcement background, but John Nicholson has the endorsement of outgoing Sheriff Steve Prater. And that's right. And uh, the administrative uh, selling point of it, of managing money, being on the uh, city council, uh, being a part of the uh, uh, group that oversees the budget for Shreveport City Police and uh, knowing those numbers, that's what John Nicholson has touted throughout his campaign that he's going to be more of an administrator thus far this evening. Uh, people are voting in his favor for that 42% of the vote turning out in Nicholson's favor. We're going to check in right now with NBC6's Brittany DeFran, who is over at Henry Whitehorn's watch party. Hi, Brittany. Hey, guys, that's right. So earlier you guys checked in, and you, we mentioned that friends and family were here, but the guest of honor has arrived. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to hear that. So it looks like things that maybe going into a runoff. How are you feeling about that? I'm still feeling very confident about the numbers and how they're shaping up. We still have some big boxes that had not been counted yet, so I'm optimistic that uh, I'm still going to be victorious tonight. All right, feeling confident here. Now, as things maybe look like they're going to a runoff, how would you continue spreading your message, um, you know, say as the campaign process continues? I will continue to beat the streets, walk in the neighborhoods, get my message out, just encouraging everybody not to let down, just to keep stay focused, and let's get our, let's get this victory done. This race, if it goes into a runoff, it's not over. We got a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of work. I've got a great team behind me. That team that I have is awesome, and so we're just ready for whatever happens tonight. That we're going to continue fighting our fight, and hopefully. Uh, the citizens of Cattle Parish will select the best person for the job. I know that throughout your campaign you talked a lot about your lengthy list of experience in law enforcement. How does that set you apart from the other candidates? I'm the only candidate in this race that have led multiple organizations on the local, state, and federal levels. I have the experience necessary to do this job. I'm the only one in this race that have led during a crisis. Uh, I led the state police during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. I was the CAO for the city during the pandemic and then the winter storm. I know how to get the job done. I'm trained in it and I have all the experience necessary and the qualifications to get the job done and get the violent offenders off our streets and out of our communities and make Cattle Parish a safe place for all of our citizens, our families, and just, just make it a good place. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. And again, we'll be here all night watching live reaction from Henry Whitehorse campaign watch party from your local election headquarters. I'm Brittany DeFran. All right, Brittany, thanks so much. 68% of the votes are in for Cato Sheriff John Nicholson currently leading. 43% of the vote going his way. Henry Whitehorn, 37%. A lot of money flowed into that race, Jackley. Locally, no surprise there. It is such a coveted position within our parish. Yeah, it definitely looks like if things keep going this way, it's going to go to a runoff for sure. Mm -hmm. We're going to send things back over to NBC6's Miriam Samake now, who is live at John Nicholson's watch party. Miriam? 
hiding. And Jackie, yes, we are still here. Uh, John Nicholson was just behind me. He's actually right behind me eating some pizza here. Again, like I said, the energy is full of ex excitement. I have heard his friends and family say this is good. We're doing a good job because he is in the lead. Uh, John Nicholson was just over here with us a moment ago, and he said that this is for everyone. This is not a win for just him, um, but it is still early to call. I know that it's about 50% of those election results coming in, but it is keeping that energy up. While he was over here with us, he did address the fact that he doesn't have much or any uh, law enforcement experience. However, his experience on city council, working with police officers, understanding that the Caddo Parish Sheriff's Office does need to work with all agencies in order to keep uh, Caddo Parish, Shreveport, Bossier, everywhere safe in our community. Uh, another thing that he said is doubling down on keeping violent criminals incarcerated. He brought up a time whenever um, a murder happened just two doors down from him, which really pushes that uh, campaign for him. So again, we will be continuing to bring you those live reactions, those live updates, uh, seeing what those polls, can, polls continue to say, because like I said, about 51%. But for now, I am reporting live for your local election headquarters. I'm Miriam Samake. Dan and Jackie. All right. Thank you very much, Miriam. Well, as she just said, he told her, yeah, I don't have any law enforcement experience, um, but he was leaning again on his um, role in city council and his administrative. Is that enough to make him sheriff? No, it, <laughs> it's not necessarily enough to make him sheriff. At this point, this is going to go to a runoff b between uh, Chief Whitehorn and between John Nicholson, which means as, as Theron said earlier, this is now a completely different race because right. you can't necessarily say that Eric Hatfield supporters are going to go to John Nicholson when a lot of Eric Hatfield supporters were not fans of Steve Prater. Steve Prater, of course, backing uh, John Nicholson. So the other part of this issue is a turnout issue. If Jeff Landry wins the governor's race tonight, Problems. that's going to take away a desire for a lot of Republicans to show up theoretically in a runoff race. That could take votes away from John Nicholson simply by the top of the ticket not being there, not being a motivator for people to get out to vote. Also look at the Senate races that are gonna happen this evening. It looks like the Senate race that's gonna be heading to a runoff is going to be a runoff between Democrats here, between mm -hmm. Cedric Lover, Sam Jenkins. That could motivate Democrats to get out and that would be an advantage for Chief Whitehorn in a runoff. Yeah, very good points. Up, yeah. yeah. There in the view from 35,000 feet here, successful metropolitan cities, growing cities, have a sheriff and a DA who work together. Mm -hmm. They work together on crime uh, to prosecute criminals. Um, there's been an adversarial relationship between the DA's office and the sheriff's office. Does that continue if John Nicholson's uh, elected into office? And what changes then between that dynamic if Henry Whitehorn were to get in? Well, I, I don't know for sure, but I would say that uh, it appears that the sheriff's relationship with the DA has been kindly put adversarial. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that John Nicholson, being the sheriff's handpicked person, I'd be really surprised if he came with a 180 degree difference mm -hmm. in his attitude, but he's an attorney and, and perhaps he knows the ropes more than what the sheriff would have known about these processes. A lot of time uh, the sheriff would say, oh, it's taking too long. I mean, it's not like folks are saying we want to take long, but there is a legal process. I think perhaps he would understand that better than, um, than uh, Steve does. So I don't know. I, it's hard to say that it'd just be um, a, re a relationship that would work the same or better. And I think with Whitehorn um, being there, I think um, we'd have to see too. I, I don't know what to anticipate because, you know, DA is an independent person, sheriff's an independent person. But in order for us to have a good law enforcement and criminal justice system, we need them, no doubt, to at least um, have a good working relationship. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Thank you so much. We're going to check in now again on the governor's race. We're going to take a look at another look at those results. Now, let's see where uh, things stand with the uh, governor's race here. At last we looked, Jeff Landry had crossed that uh, threshold that he needed to cross. Obviously, 50% plus one vote makes him the governor tonight. No need for uh, a runoff election there. Kind of surprising. I thought he was going to get close to that number. At last we had looked, uh, Landry had crossed that number. If we can get those uh, numbers up to see where everything stands at this time. 63% of the vote was in the last time we looked at the governor's race here. Uh, and currently, oh, I'm sorry, it was... Uh, 83%, not 63%, 87% in now. Jeff Landry sits at 53% of the vote. Sean Wilson was just 25%, so uh, this may not go into a runoff. He could 
win outright tonight. We're going to check out with NBC Six's Alexandra Meacham. She joins us now live at Jeff Landry's watch party in Broussard. Alex? Dan and Jackie, great to hear from you. Attorney General Jeff Landry is holding his watch party in his hometown of Lafayette, Louisiana. He actually lives four minutes down the street from this event center in Broussard, Louisiana. His campaign manager says he has spent the day relaxing, spending time with his wife, and attended mass earlier today. This comes after a 72-hour diner dash across the state of Louisiana, trying to meet with voters and connect with his last message for his campaign. He came to Shreveport earlier this week week on Wednesday, coming to Strawn's Eat Shop, later went to Monroe, and then later stopped back by in his hometown of Lafayette. Now we know Landry is the front runner of this race. He picked up a key endorsement from the Republican Party very early on, which drew a lot of opposition from his opponents. Now we know Landry has the most campaign money on hand with about $11 million in cash on hand and campaign donations. A lot of that, millions of dollars, comes from super PAC money. A lot of that being from the oil and gas industry, which he has been a staunch advocate of since his days as a representative. Now, with that advantage in name recognition, key endorsements, and cash on hand, he is, he is, sorry, we're hearing that Landry is actually going to be talking soon, so we're going to stand by. People are getting ready to speak with Landry, but in the meantime, we know that Landry has drawn a lot of, he's coming in soon, he's drawn a lot of opposition from his opponents. Sorry, we are standing by waiting to hear from him. He met with voters earlier this week just trying to push his last campaign message, trying to connect with people just across the state. All right, give us a few more minutes, Dan and Jackie. Come back to us in five minutes, and Landry should be back out. For your local election headquarters, I'm Alexandra Meacham. All right, thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> yeah, we'll catch you on the NBC6 side because that's it for us with our election special here on our website, ktalnews.com. Please make sure you join us on NBC6 News at 10 o'clock.